Hey, what's up? I'm Jason, and today I'm going to show you some signs that your game architecture might have problems. While I show you those signs, I'll give you some practical ways to address those issues. And by the end of the video, it should be a little bit easier for you to finish your projects and get them released. Before we get started, though, if you're interested in game architecture and this kind of stuff, make sure that you hit the like button, hit the subscribe, hit the little alert, and most important, just hit the share. What we're going to do is cover eight things that I've seen appear throughout my life and just throughout a bunch of different game projects, and they kind of pop up a lot. So just follow along and hopefully you get a lot from this. Let's get started. Number one, having game logic in your UI. This usually starts off with just a little bit of state data. Maybe we've got a thing's health or a thing's damage or some other thing that we want to show in the UI. Maybe it's our weapon damage or our ammo amount. And the first place that we want to see it is in the UI. So we just kind of hook it up there. We put a ammo amount in the UI and start writing to it and then maybe start reading from it and things get really, really messy. We generally don't want to have any real state data in the UI other than very specific UI state. We don't want to have game state data in there at all. Generally, you want to keep that stuff out and then use a binding method or something like that where when the base data source changes, it updates that UI element. Now, I don't want to go too deep into how to bind things up. There are a lot of videos out there, and I'll link some on how to bind up data to a UI, but don't keep a lot of logic or state data in there in general. Now, the other problem that happens here, and this is, I think, a bigger one when you're starting out, or more specifically when you're starting out with 2D games, is that people end up putting a lot of their game flow control into the UI as well. So this could be a matter of we start with the menu panel enabled, and when that switches over, the game panel enables, and then the game panel is running the things. And then when that changes over, we enable another panel, and then that's changing things. And all of the state control is based on which panel is enabled. If you suddenly enabled two panels at the same time, everything blows up. If things don't enable and disable exactly right, things blow up. If people make changes to the UI, that's generally where things get really bad because we're relying on states to be a very specific way and we just run into a lot of problems. It also becomes a lot harder to debug and a lot harder to fix things because our UI elements start relying on each other and really just controlling our game. So what I would recommend here is to build out some sort of a class to manage the state of your game. Of course, if it's a very simple game, you're building Flappy Bird, whatever, you don't need this, right? But if you're building anything that you're going to be working on for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, have some sort of a game state or game manager class that's controlling where your game is in the flow of things. If is it in a mode where you're taking player input, if you switch between those two modes, like you have a player can do things and player can't do things mode, is it in a mode where you're getting like storyline stuff and cinematics happening or switching levels or anything like that? Keep control of that in a class and maybe consider building out a state machine. Now, if you haven't used a state machine for game control, I also have a video on that, but I was thinking about doing another one. So if you're interested in learning a lot more about state machines just to control a game, drop a comment below and I'll get around to doing one of those quickly. If nobody cares, then I'll move on to other stuff. But if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, just drop a comment and let me know. Number two is one you've probably heard about, and it's one that I mention all the time and people talk about all the time, but nobody really talks about why it happens or how to address it. And that's having mega monolithic giant monster classes. These are those classes that are a thousand lines, 5,000 lines, 10,000 lines, or 30,000 lines. Like I've, I've seen all the extremes of craziness, right? Where they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this isn't something that happens intentionally. It's not like people just go in and say, hey, I'm going to build my entire game in this one class. I take that back. Most of the time that doesn't happen intentionally. Sometimes people do that because they think that that's the easiest way to do things. Um, and it's because it is at first. When you start off, having one class is very easy. Not having to deal with a second class makes it very, very simple. Everything's right there. Once your project grows, it of course becomes a giant nightmare because you can't change things without breaking things. When you have one big giant monolithic class, tends to be very, 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 very brittle and make it so that you can't make changes. I've told a story before about um, my buddy Jared who's working on 
a single method that was 10,000 lines long. They couldn't make changes to the inventory system because this method was so big and so brittle that any change was likely to just break everything. In fact, I think that was kind of the conclusion that they came to, that the whole method, the entire way that that system worked needed to be redone to deal with the issue. It was just too brittle and took six months to clean up, right? And this is on like a live AAA game. So having big classes, it's not something that only happens as you're a noob or only happens to people who don't know how to code. It happens as a side effect of time. As we keep building and we keep adding things on, it's very easy to just slap another thing on and slap another thing on and add one more property and add one more method and we'll clean it up later and to get into that mindset. But what you really need to do is just clean things as you're working. Split things out as you're going. As soon as you see things getting large, you see your class getting two, 300 lines long, um, look at it, investigate it and say, hey, does this make sense as one class or is there a way that I can split this into multiple classes, a way that I can separate the, the logic here into maybe a, a, another system or another set of controllers or some other objects or maybe I can split out the data from the, the logic or something else. Usually it's that the class is just doing too many things and we can split it out and separate it out. And a lot of the time that's because the class is, um, well, it's doing things for a bunch of use cases. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more later when we jump into interfaces. Number three, having everything be public. Now, this happens really often when people first start out, and that's because they see things and they see that they need to make things public to edit them in the inspector. So they'll create a mono behavior, add a bunch of public fields to it, and then start using those fields all around. This causes the very obvious problem of people sometimes getting confused between the data from the prefab and the state data of an object. Maybe we've got you know, a weapon and it has a damage amount on it, or let's go with something even better, like an enemy and it's got a health on it. And we're setting up the health on the prefab, we've put in a value there, and then we are spawning the guy and then reusing that health value. This tends to cause all kinds of problems. The biggest problem being that, well, we're kind of reusing our initial health as a health, as a current health, and not separating those things out. So we don't have a way to even tell what the initial health is without referencing back to the prefab. And if we reference back to the prefab, we can accidentally change the prefab. We could reference the prefab, modify its health, and have that thing go up and down. And that's one of the issues. But the other problem that you'll run into with having everything public is that you find yourself having a project full of spaghetti code where things are referencing properties and methods on other classes back and forth all around the place and it's very hard to follow the flow. It doesn't happen all the time and it's not necessary to happen, but it's very likely to happen when things are public. You generally want things to be public only if they're intended to be used by another class. If there's no intention of them being used by another class, make them private, or if they're going to be inherited from like an abstract class or a base class, make them protected. Don't make everything public by default. Make it private by default and only expose it when you need to. And then when you expose it, really think about it. Think, is this right? Should I be exposing this? Should this be public? Does it make sense? That doesn't mean like overthink it and don't make anything public ever, but don't just do it by default without giving it any thought. Think about the other opportunities and other ways that you could do it. Is there something else in that class that could modify the thing? Should that class be modified by the other thing if it's a property or should the other thing be calling my, my methods? If not, then change it up and, and just start to think about it and be aware. Whenever you have too many public things, it's usually a very bad sign. Number four is having setters with side effects. To show this, I really wanted to bring up a code example. So here we go. We have a vehicle and our vehicle has a damage property on it. And when we get hit with any collision, we're just saying damage plus equals one. We'll just add one point of damage to the thing. Nice and simple, right? And it might seem like, okay, something's damaging the vehicle. The damage amount is going up. But let's... um take a look here. Let's go take a peek at damage. Maybe we see that, hey, every time we're hitting this guy, we're getting a spike. We're getting a, a lag spike or a little bit of slowness or something else. And we just hit F12 and go out in here and expand it and look and see what's going on. We'll realize that 
our setter here isn't just setting an int. So when we're doing plus equals one, our setter is doing some other stuff. It's setting that damage value to the new one. So it's reading damage, calling the get, and then it's setting it to the new value of that plus one right here. And then we're calling this send damage method and then just incrementing hits taken. Okay, so we go into send damage, take a peek. Expand this out and I didn't implement it, but I've seen this time after time after time on all kinds of projects, not just multiplayer projects, but single player stuff where it's maybe not a network thing, but something else. But something is happening in this send damage. Maybe we're sending out a network call, we're writing something off to a database, or we're just performing like something that takes a screenshot, who knows? It could be some kind of crazy thing that's happening that's slow. A lot of the time, this would be like a network call though. So every time we change our damage, our, our um, network call is being made and it's slow. So imagine we set something up that's like incrementing damage a couple times, Maybe we have a loop here, like four, one to 10. Maybe this is some damage over time thing. I don't know. And we loop over it. Now we're doing it 10 times. We're sending that message 10 times and we don't know it. The reason that this is a problem, it's not a problem to send the damage or increment the number of hits taken. It's a problem to hide that. This looks innocuous. It looks simple, like it's not gonna hurt anything and it's causing a ton of extra work. This is a good way to accidentally kill your project and accidentally cause all kinds of performance problems. It also really just hides the complexity of what's going on here and is probably doing things that we don't necessarily want to do. But there's more. Let's look at hits taken. We go check out hits taken. We're just incrementing that, right? Let's expand it out. Oh yeah, that one also does this. So this one has a setter where we check more stuff. We increment the value of hits taken by the by the amount, in fact, that's wrong, so we break it. That should be equals the value. So we set the value here, and then we check to see if it's too many hits. If it's too many hits, we call break armor, which who knows what that does. Maybe it breaks all of my armor. Here, it just throws an exception. And if it's not, then we save off that number of hits and write it out to a database. Again, some of these use cases may not be exactly what you'd have. It could be just that you're writing out to a web request. You're saving off some player state data, sending off some you know, HTTP request to a server or to some other thing that you're doing. Or maybe you're just writing player prefs. And every time you change the value, you're writing that player prefs thing for no reason hurting performance and just doing bad things for no good reason because they're hidden or well, really because they're hidden. So how do you get around this? How do you avoid having this problem, this secret little hidden stuff? Well, what I would recommend is have your setters never do anything special. Just have them be kind of blank, get and set. They just read the data unless they're doing some sort of special caching. If they're doing a caching like a singleton does, kind of where we get something, we store it there the one time, and we don't pull it again, that, then sometimes that's okay. But for the setter, if you want to do something special, make a set method. Make a set method that either has, should I do the hard part as a parameter, like set, and then an optional thing to propagate that on the network or replicate it out or save to the database, like a Boolean parameter that defaults to false, or have a set and then maybe a set and replicator, a set and persist type method that does both of those, that does the set and the, the persisting part at once so that you can separate that out and make those calls intelligently so that when you want to change a value, you can change a value, but you can change it without necessarily doing the special stuff. Now, if every time you change it, you need to do whatever the special thing is, then just spell that out in the method, right? Have that set and save method and only use that. And then when people use it, they're going to know, hey, every time I call this, I'm also saving. So let me be intelligent about it. Maybe cache the number up, the whatever it is that I'm saving, and then do it all in one shot. All right, number five is when we have giant prefabs. I've been you know, guilty of this before. I've done it myself plenty of times where I just build up a prefab and I start it off small and slowly start adding more and more things to it. This often begins with UI prefabs. I've done it with characters, items, all kinds of things. And the prefabs get bigger, more complicated, and harder to manage. Now, this isn't one where I think I really need to even explain the problems. I, the biggest problems are 
just that it's hard to work with other people. It's hard to make changes to it and it's hard to save. And then it's also hard to reuse functionality across a big prefab. So those are the issues. Let me just tell you what I would recommend to fix it. And that's to split your prefabs into multiple smaller prefabs. If you have a big UI, put that into a level. Consider using a scene as a prefab or a scene full of prefabs instead of a giant prefab. Or consider using nested prefabs. The new nested prefab system is pretty easy to use and it's available now. So you can set up a prefab and then nest other child prefabs underneath it. So then you can have a bunch of little prefabs and then one that's just kind of a container for them. Uh, the other option that I would recommend and one of the ones I really like is to use prefab variants. These came with the new prefab workflow as well. And they make it so that you don't have to create a bunch of different prefabs for things or you don't have to create a very complex prefab, I guess. So what I've seen people do is like maybe create a monster and under that monster, they've got you know, 10 different models. Obviously not the best way to do it. And there are other ways around it, but another alternative to just having all of those and enabling and disabling you know, to get the correct one available is to just use prefab variants. So if you're doing something like that, consider the variants. They allow you to just make a base prefab that has the, the core part of the prefab, all of the, the functionality and the logic, and then swap out components or visuals really, really easily without having to write a bunch of code. And I get that that's why a lot of the time people do that. They'll build a prefab with a bunch of things underneath it because they don't want to write the code to load those dynamically. Maybe it doesn't matter for your project, but going to variants will make it so that you don't have to do that and make things easier. Now, if you're interested in prefab variants, again, just let me know, drop a comment below, and I'll do another video on how to use the variants to shrink down prefabs, maybe. maybe I'll do another one on UIs too. Just let me know in the comments so if that's the kind of thing that you wanna see. Number six, not using interfaces. And I understand why this happens. A lot of people are listening going, what's well, an interface? I've never even heard of that. And if that's the case, I highly recommend you just go look into interfaces, watch one of my videos on how to use interfaces in Unity, and well, listen to the rest of this because I'm gonna explain why it's a problem. But first I wanna mention that it is really easy to misuse interfaces. It's easy to add just too many interfaces and add interfaces where you don't necessarily need them. When you start off with them, it kind of happens to a lot of us where we'll just make interfaces for everything, even though we're not ever going to swap out the implementation. It's also just as bad though to never use interfaces, to not figure out what they are, not learn how to use them and not get the benefits that are there because they really have a big part to play, I think, in just general C-sharp development and they really help a lot in game development. So if you're not using interfaces, you need to figure them out, you need to understand them and get a real good grasp on how to use them in your project. Now, I wanna give a quick example or a quick explanation of cases where you would wanna use an interface. And the biggest ones are where you have a system that needs to interact with two different types of objects, but in the same kind of way. Maybe you've got um, a player or a, a character and a crate, and they both need to take some damage. One way you could do that is have like a shared health component. It's just a mono behavior that's a health that, um, takes damage and that's it. You look for the health part on them and they take damage. And that's something that a lot of us will do. We'll set up something just like that. But then you run into these weird cases or say you've got a health component, but maybe your crate acts differently. When it takes damage, it doesn't die. Maybe it resets or it, um, maybe it's not a crate. It's a thing that you shoot a couple times, it opens up and then it closes and then you gotta do it again. And you wanna override that functionality. What tends to happen is then we end up with a health script that's more complicated and it has these special case checks to, oh, when I die, don't die, open up a thing, or here are the events to fire off when I die, or it does something different and we have to hook up things either in the editor or have designers change things and we end up with a more complicated health script. Instead, what I would recommend and what interfaces allow us to do is define a common interface like an I take damage or an I have health or something like that and give it a public method. Well, interface methods are all public. You'd give it a method like take damage and then you make both health components, your player health or your character health and your crate health, implement that I take damage interface. 
They can implement it in different ways. They can do different things based on what, what needs to happen. And you don't end up having, well, dirty code that does different things based on what type of object it's hooked up to. So look at interfaces. That's only one of the dozens of different things that you can do with interfaces or use cases. Like, I mean, I could think of probably an infinite number of them. Well, not infinite, but you get the idea. There are a lot. There's one other benefit, though, and that if you use interfaces, it makes unit testing your code dramatically easier. Now, you might think like, hey, I don't unit test my code. You might want to one day. You might get into the case of, hey, I'm tired of things breaking. I want to have some tests on my code and know when stuff's going wrong and be able to prevent that. Interfaces are kind of the first step along the way of making that possible. Number seven, completely ignoring garbage collection and performance issues. This happens a lot. This happens for pretty much everybody. And it's, I think, a side effect of us starting off with prototypes and practice projects where it just doesn't matter. Having garbage collection problems in your hackathon thing or your little you know, game that you threw together in a week isn't going to matter. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to notice. But it gets you into a habit or a set of bad habits where you can start just allocating things that you don't necessarily need or doing things that are bad for performance for no real reason other than you just didn't think about it. And there may be easier, faster, simpler ways to do it that are also more performant. So you want to get into the habit of at least investigating your garbage allocations in the profiler and checking on your performance a bit. Don't do it kind of obsessively, like don't be in there every time you make a change, go in and profile that change. You might be in a case where you need to do that, but for most of the time, most of us don't need to do that. And you don't need to get um, too worried about code as you're going through it. If you see little things where there's a minor performance increase, um, don't, don't stress about it and don't think about it too much. You may end up breaking something if you're not sure, especially if your code's not tested. But if you see bigger architectural issues or bigger problems where you know something is happening that doesn't need to happen or you know there's an easier, faster way to fix it, try to fix those up. And most importantly, look at what the profiler is telling you. Find the problems in there because that's going to tell you where the actual issues are and prevent you from wasting time on things that don't matter and kind of let you focus on the stuff that does matter. Number eight, this is the last one and probably one of the most important ones, and that's not sharing what you're doing, not sharing your code and your architecture and not getting any feedback on it. This also includes not looking at other people's architecture. If all you ever see is what you're working on and maybe the stuff that you create and perhaps it's the stuff that somebody else created before you, you're not going to grow and you're not going to learn new ways to do things. And a lot of the time, and we'll come into a project and we'll see stuff that was there before and we just kind of pick up those patterns. I know when I first started out coding, you know, decades ago, that's exactly what I did, right? I guess it was less than decades, single decade plus right, ago. I started it, I look at code and I kind of followed and copied some of those patterns. Some of those patterns were from people who didn't know exactly what they were doing at the time and didn't like those patterns later, right? They'd come and go, why are you doing this? So, oh, hey, I copied that and say, oh, that was me. That was terrible. I shouldn't have done it that way. Let me show you how I do it now. And if you just kind of stay with one project and one example, it's easy to fall into that where you just kind of go with that thing and you don't grow and try out new stuff. You don't learn new, easier ways to do things to keep stuff simple and fast at the same time. So I highly recommend that you Share as much as you can. If you're able to share your projects, you're able to share your code, share them with other people that you know. Run friends through it. Explain the code to them, especially if you have other friends that work in game development. Explain things to them. Get feedback on them and get advice from them and start implementing the advice. Try to do it, even if you can do it live there, if you can get on a call with somebody and just kind of go through and get step-by-step -step feedback and start changing things up, that is an amazing way to just get better at it. Um, or just look at other people's stuff. Like I said before, find other people's game architecture, find other people's code, find people that want you to look at their stuff, go look at their stuff, give them feedback. You're going to grow. You're going to learn more about it. Now, if you don't know where to do that, um, it's kind of hard to find places for that. I'm going to put a special link to the discord server down below. It's normally, I think just, just Patreons are getting in there, but I think you still get a special badge if you're on Patreon. Also, if you're on Patreon, Definitely special thanks. Really appreciate it. Um, 
show off the special badges in, uh, in Discord to everybody else. Um, and if you have architecture stuff, just feel free to hop in. Just join us and uh, talk and share your stuff. Other than that, uh, most importantly, again, don't forget to share the video. If you got to the end, just hit share and drop it wherever. It doesn't matter if none of your friends like game development stuff. I don't think. Just share it. Anyway, <laughs> thanks again. Appreciate it. I hope you guys like this stuff. If you have questions or comments, just drop them below. I'll try to follow them. And a lot of other people are also great at answering those. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks again. Bye.